My new podcast from Religion of Sports and PRX will take on some of the biggest questions in sports. Why do we buy into the notion a player who took money while in college is somehow evil? And some you never thought to ask. They're like, where's his ear? It's not in here. I'm like, well, I don't got his ear. It was a skin heist. Holy that's Holyfield's ear. Every episode will explore the mysteries of the lost, the forgotten, and the disappeared. It was a death in the family. Sports journalist Ben Baskin has written for Sports Illustrated, and he's now the host of Lost in Sports, the podcast you just heard about. Good morning, Ben. Good to see you. Hey, Dan, Rob, and Pat. Thank you guys so much for having me. Hey, I, I know we probably have an order here that we're supposed to go in, but I, I got to jump right to the to the Tyson Holyfield. <laughs> um, they did, I'm reading this. They did find his ear, right? They did ultimately find the piece of his ear that walked me through this. It's one of my favorites of the, of the season. So, you know, 1997, Mike Tyson fought Evander Holyfield, heavyweight title rematch. Everyone remembers it. Everyone remembers that Mike Tyson bit off a piece of Evander Holyfield's ear. Um, what people don't really know is that that piece of ear was found in the ring after the fight yeah. and delivered to Evander Holyfield, and then it went missing and it was lost forever. And you know, people got blamed and you know, shared rumors of impropriety. And it kind of connected the lives of a few different guys who got blamed for this. Some who found it, some who were held holding it, and. I kind of, you know, I wanted to track down what actually happened. And also, why did Mike Tyson do this in the first place? Do we know oh. the answer to that after all these <laughs> years? Or is it just, he's, he's, you know, cops do, I don't know. You, you'll know it once that episode comes out in about a month, I think. I think that's our fourth of the season. Um, we actually do come to a, a real answer more than just Mike Tyson is, is Mike Tyson. Huh. You know, it's kind of viewed as this guy that you can't explain, but there, there is, if you dig into it, there is a lot more there that does actually make the inexplicable a little bit more, you know, possible to, to find explanation for. What about this story about the Cleveland Browns from the 80s making some kind of movie? <laughs> So that was our first episode of the season, and it's uh, one. It's it's probably our craziest, our wackiest. So, it's uh, in 1986, the Cleveland Browns <laughs> filmed a time travel sword and sorcery movie called Masters of the Gridiron. Um, it's got a, a wrestling bear, swords, sword fighting. It's something that would never be feasible, could never happen in the NFL. Today. What? And I stumbled upon this movie when I was in Cleveland. I kind of just saw it. I never heard of it. No one's heard of it. And that episode is all about finding out why this movie exists, how it was made, and how is it possible that no one has ever heard of it before. No one's. <laughs> it looks amazing. Did anybody involved with the movie ever go on to do anything? Like, they're, they're like we're not going to learn that like a young Steven Spielberg directed this, are we? <laughs> Not quite, but I did talk, I did get to introduce the movie to the, uh, the Russo brothers, Joe and Anthony Russo, some of my favorite directors, you know, filmmakers in the world, and they're diehard Cleveland Browns fans. They had never heard of this movie either. Wow. So I reached out to them. We managed to watch the movie with them on Zoom like we're doing now, but we, I showed them this movie. And, you know, it was, that was a high point for me because I love the Avengers, I love community. So introducing the Russo brothers to this Masters of the Gridiron is, it's how the episode starts and it, you know, it, that was a real, that was real fun for me. All right, you have another episode here uh, about a traveling basketball competition. So, yeah, so I, it, for, for basketball fans, that just came out last week and any basketball fan, especially of my generation, will remember and one. The and one, I have the book right here, the and one street ball behind me. Um, in the early 2000s, and one, you know, a small apparel company turned streetball, you know, New York style streetball into a worldwide phenomenon. They went, you know, they had a, a tour around the country. It started with a mixtape, but it ended, you know, a few years later with a worldwide tour. They went to every country pretty much. And streetball, it was the epitome of cool for basketball fans. You know, I was growing up as a diehard basketball fan. I watched this every week, I had every mixtape. So I always wondered how did And One, a small you know, company that made shoes and t-shirts, turn streetball into this worldwide phenomenon? And then how it all just disappeared one day. Like there was a tour, there was a TV show, there was a video game, it was huge. And then one day it just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so that episode kind of dives into the And One mixtapes, the And One mixtape tour, how it happened and where did it all go? And it turned out to be a very sort of deep story with cultural appropriation and kind of more twists and turns than I ever sort of would have imagined with it.
Ben, the Hartford Whalers, for those who don't remember, a uh, former NHL franchise, ha haven't been a franchise since, what, 1997. And I would, I would bet that I see more Hartford Whalers apparel now than I did in 1997. Why is that? Well, so the, the, that story is one of these. I grew up in Connecticut. I was not a hockey fan, and I was not even alive during the heyday of the Whalers. Um, they moved when I was about seven. But Whalers gear, Whalers hats, Whalers logo is everywhere. And for a state like Connecticut that has no professional teams in the major leagues, um, the you know the, in the Big Five leagues, they. The Whalers were all, any, the only thing Connecticut had was this team. And I wanted to find out sort of how did Connecticut get a hockey team in the first place? Why did it get, you know, torn out of the state? And as you just mentioned, why is it more popular now? Why, wherever you go, you see Hartford Whalers gear than, you know, when the team existed. It's sort of, it's still one of the best selling logos in sports. It's still kind of at the top of the charts for hockey. So that episode, it's going to be our fifth of the season. Um, and it's going to dive into all of that. You know, we talk to the fans and the owners and players on the Whalers to kind of figure out, you know, all of those questions. That's uh, a very personal story, kind of very poignant about kind of how much a city and a, and a state can love a team and what happens when that team, you know, disappears. Wow. Well, the podcast is Lost in Sports. Fascinating stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you guys for having me.